Found love. You were your friends. You go this and you go to speak to the police. You don't speak to me. Why don't you speak to me? I'm your friend. I'm going to make him an offer. He can't refuse. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us for the episode of Film Club. I am one of your hosts, Andy Harrison. To my right, as always, it's the internet's Marlon Brando, Andy Donaldson. Uh, hello. How would you feel about being the internet's Marlon Brando? I'd be pretty happy with that. As long as I'm not associated with your impression. Every single week in Film Club, we invite you along to watch a film with us. We dive into some of cinema's best before coming back here to talk it out. Andy, this week... We've finally fucking done The Godfather. Oh, my days. We've finally, finally. done The Godfather. Um, i not even going to really break it down. The Godfather is the rise and fall of the... Well, in this case, the rise of the Corleone family. That's That is your brief. You Perfect. watch it. If you don't know what it is, fucking watch it. If you haven't seen it before and you're watching this review, stop, pause it, unsubscribe. <laughs> <laughs> and just watch it, then resubscribe and watch this because, Christ, we do not want this spoiler for you. We don't know anything about this because, to me, watching it again it is in the top ten. It's um, I didn't realise at the time. I, I found myself since our last watch, re-watching this so many times, so many scenes on YouTube, um, so many moments like this. It's... Three hours long, more or less, 177 minutes or something daft. Um, you know how I feel. How do you feel? Um, so, for me, right, this, this is, we've mentioned this in the show before, but it's worth talking about here because I had never seen The Godfather. And it, at one point, it had become like sort of an actively hadn't watched The Godfather sort of thing. You know, what like, are you waiting for this episode? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. I mean, we started doing Film Club. I think we made a list of films that we yeah. need to review. And on that list was The Godfather. Yeah. And actually pretty near the top was The Godfather. And we yeah. had a discussion. I'd never seen it and purposefully never watched it so we could have this this moment right much now. Much like me with 2001 Space Odyssey. Yeah, exactly. Um, but this went on way too long. <laughs> and then watching it this weekend... It was absolutely bloody brilliant. It's absolutely fantastic. It is Francis Ford Coppola at his absolute highest of power. Yep. It's Francis Ford Coppola understanding exactly what he wants from a film and executing on it. And that is the most succinct way I can put it. Somebody who knew exactly what they wanted and did that. I watched this again for God knows how many times. And to be fair, it's not that often, but obviously the amount of scenes. I just didn't realize how every scene every bit of dialogue in this film is relevant to the whole film and what i mean by that it might be a weird thing to say sometimes you can get filler moments sometimes you get little conversations on the side sometimes you can get little almost like side quests in the godfather side quests yeah in the godfather everything is fucking there like every conversation that is present everything that's happening has a forward goal it helps i've seen it before has a forward goal uh, reflecting on a backwards um what's happened in the past or what's in the present like I know people say, say that about every film, you know, dialogues, you know, written, script and stuff like that. Fucking watch this and every bit of dialogue is relevant to the film and relevant to The Godfather, relevant to the family's progression, everything like that. It's, it was, oh my days, it was mind-blowing watching it again. It was nice analysing. It was, it's all, where it's do we all, start? So it's all wrapped in what I think is one of my favourite things about the entire film, which is the cinematography. It's some of the most beautiful, purposeful and also restrained yep, very pieces much. of cinematography yep. I've ever seen in my life. Everything has this, like, Ooh. the colours in the film are deep and then they are rich. And it's done by Gordon Willis. Who did Annie Hall. Who did Annie Hall and Manhattan and Zelig. Oh, he did Zelig as well. He did oh, Zelig. Zelig was awesome. Um, and, yeah, the colour palette is deep and rich and dark and moody and... The camera moves are when they're when they're there and they're apparent. They're subtle and they're well implemented. And when it's static, it's it's beautifully framed and it has an edge of noir and it oozes atmosphere. And to contrast that on a technicality perspective, the music is fucking killer. The music is amazing. We went on about The Exorcist about how it's so subtle in its use of music. We went on about the film that we did um, where it's quite often uses a lot of music. Not Love Actually. It was um, Road to Perdition. Um, uses quite a lot of music. This is, it, it hits every barrier. It doesn't use music that often, but when it does, my God, is it good. Obviously, you have the main theme and everything like that that kicks in a couple of times um, in the major moments. Um, done by Nino Rota, Rota, if I mispronounce that. Um, but then he brought his father in, didn't he? So it's done by uh, Nino Rota, or Rota yeah. um, but then he brought his father in afterwards to do a rework on it. I did not know that. Who also did know that. Apocalypse Now, if I remember right. There we are. What, him or his father? His father. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's stunning. It really is. It leads the film, uh, film. It leads the film in such a way that you, you can't help but strive forward. It, it, it's, I can't remember what we were on about it. We were a little review a while back. You have stuff that kind of like 
pushes you forward with the pace of the film, but not just like that kind of the way it's filmed, the way it's shot, the way that the, the characters are moving, like stuff like, you know, we're on about um, Kira Kurosawa, how he leads you forward in the frames. This, the music, but this also, um, as well as performances, like the music is just fucking exceptional. It is. And then you mentioned there, so you kind of can't talk about The Godfather without giving a huge heaping of credit to the performances in this film. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. The, the most obvious one, right? Let's talk about this and get it out of the way. It's Marlon Brando. Is, now, he, is this the one where he won an Academy Award but didn't do it because of, he was in protest? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Now, Marlon Brando, like, I just want to... Going into this for the first time, having not seen The Godfather before, but being immensely aware of the idea of The Godfather... And also having The Godfather so ingrained in the popular zeitgeist, you kind of know elements about yeah. Marlon Brando. Yeah. I was shocked at how little he's in this film. Yes. Yeah. Because he's in the first I think this quarter. is the... No, sorry, go on. Then he disappears. And then when he comes back, he's, he's back in it for a decent chunk, but he's also very subdued at that point. That's when he's, that's when he's passing off the mantle yeah, to, yeah. to Michael. So he's not the, uh, the mob boss Godfather you know at the beginning. Um, and I couldn't believe that that's all that exists of, of Marlon Brando because it's a performance upon seeing it. You just want more of it. You want to see more of him on screen. Every moment that he's on screen, you are like, you're just drawn to him and his presence and you want to know what he's in. It feels weirdly unpredictable, even though he never does anything that is unpredictable in this film. And it's because of this huge amount of like power and respect he's commanding in his physical presence. Yep. And then that is also being supported by the script and the way people are being written to uh, to come to this guy and openly ask questions with a sort of tentative uh, nervousness about them. Uh, it's two main uh, scenes of Man, uh, Marlon Brando's uh, God, uh, Godfather, Vito Corleone. Um, his, his acting ability to contrast one another. <clears throat> but um, to um, give examples of what Andy's saying there, is the first one was the intro. The intro is absolutely stunning. The intro is stunning. It's iconic. Like there's it's, there's no other word for it than iconic. Yeah. You have a guy come in, he's breaking down, and he you can see the frame is exceptional. You see um, the back of um, the Godfather, and just that little moment when he's breaking down, you just see his hand movements like that. Instant power because this guy's like you look at the frame, he's massive compared to this guy. He's got the arm move like that, get him a drink. He drinks across like this, and then it comes down to the moment where it's on a. The guy said his piece, and then you see Brando, and then you see him, and then you do this, and he does all that, and he said, I'll help you out. That whole scene about the friend, and then he goes and see Johnny, and like just this amazing presence, this amazing commanding presence. How do you, how well do you act like when you just got your back to a fucking camera, and all you do is a hand movement like this, and yes, the camera movement helped, and you just see this moment go across, like that's stunning. But then to contrast that on a different level is when he's in bed, he's, he's ill, and uh, this is where Michael's gone to uh, Sicily, and um. He, he, you know, he was like, oh, you know, all right, everything, this, you know, everything's all right, the, the business is fine and the family's great. He's like this, where's Michael? And then he, like, they tell him, like, oh, Michael did it. And he just goes, like that. Yeah, and like, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm there like this, I'm like, See, all my days. I, I thought you were going to go, my, the, the, the third scene I can tack on to this, and if you don't mind, is the thing, the, the, sorry, the, the scene where he goes to... Um, uh, oh, when he's he, the, the five families and they're having a meeting, and he goes, that I do not... Um, that I cannot forgive. No, I, I, no, I was talking about where he goes uh, to arrange the, the, the coffin he goes for. You know, he goes to, to see the dude later on. Oh, about, Sonny, yeah. Sonny. Yeah, because Sonny's just been killed. Yeah, uh, and he goes, it's the guy that started the and film. When when he's it's, told, yeah, exactly, it's it's him who he's, who he's gone back to, to, get his, to get his favour from. Um, when he, when Sonny, he's told that Sonny's dead, he doesn't react in a sort of big outburst. He does that calm, right, let, let's take care of everything. You get that lingering camera movement where he's allowed to stand in the hallway for a second, and then he finally kind of lets out in front of a stranger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fucking. So that's that's just Marlon Brando. <laughs> that's Marlon Brando. Uh, we, the obvious one is Al Pacino. Al Pacino did huge Who's killer, absolute, absolute killer in this film. This is one of his subdued performances. So Al Pacino is. is nowadays known as <laughs> yeah. We, we know uh, Al Pacino nowadays. He's part of the characters. Yeah, the characters. He's, he's known for being this huge sort of personality. He, he's known for actually is overacting, if anything. Which is kind of overacting, but I wouldn't say um, that is example of Godfather. No, we'll, no, not we'll at come all. come on to that in, like, later, as you probably hear. Um, but in this performance, you have a guy who's, like, not naive. He's just a bit of the... He's, he's the, the quiet one of the family and everything like this. You know, he feels like the black sheep at first. Yeah, the black sheep. And then he comes in and he's like... And it's just that simple thing. He's talking to Kay, and he's just like, "Oh, this is my family. You know, you had that guy shot. This is just what they do." And he's like, kind of head down. It's almost like he's 
not antisocial, he's almost like he's a bit more introverted as opposed to extroverted, where everyone else, you've got Sonny, who's a big loud mouth, he cares for the family, and he's, he gets a bit aggressive, stuff like this. You've got Tom, who's a bit, like, hugely composed, but he's also the one that's, like, the front face of the family when it's dealing with political kind of stuff. And then you've got, like, uh, Michael, who's just, like, quiet, composed, like this. And then, obviously, you have that scene where he ends up topping the uh, copper. And um, so it's at Sal- Salazzo. Okay. So, before you move over that, yep. I think that is where the film absolutely culminated into everything it promised in the first half. That is where I think the cinematography, married with the music, married with what, the performances, married with the directing. The scene where he goes into the diner um, to... Uh, again, to, I'm pretty sure that's the, the main theme coming across again. Yeah, and it, the best thing is they hold off on it for the entire scene until after the moment's done. And it's when he leaves, that's when you get this sort of booming music. Yep. It's probably the loudest mix in the entire film. Yeah. Um, and then to, to have the balls on Coppola to have a sequence take place where these two characters are having a discussion in Italian and to not put subtitles I love that on stuff. It. I love that stuff. It happens quite often in, um, in in the Godfather series where they have these conversations that you don't need to know what they're saying. So you know what I was saying before, like all the dialogue is relevant to what they're doing. Only the scenes that are sub- uh, subtitled have relevancy towards what the Godfather is. Yeah. But that's just adding a bit of atmosphere when it's unsubtitled. Uh, unsub- it's also like in that particular moment, it's letting you focus in on uh, Michael, on uh, uh, Al Pacino, because in his head, he doesn't give a shit about what they're talking about either. Like he's having that conversation, but it doesn't matter because he's thinking about other things and lets us in order, as an audience kind of step outside of that, get rid of all the noise and just have a look at what's going on. Now, I think Coppola in the past has said that like, he didn't subtitle that sequence because they were talking too fast. Really? Now, I don't know if that's him being sort of like director flippant and actually had this other intention, but I think regardless, it works in terms of letting us just focus on Michael and what's about to happen. And then obviously you've got the second half where he starts becoming the person he starts, but the family's interested in. One slight subtle note, just to go on this, we mentioned about films before where um, time shifts and um, so, sometimes it's like massive in your face or it's been two years later. In this, it's so fucking well done. Like, it's just a little, like, oh, it's been a year since I saw you, or it's been like this, like it, that. It, I'll be honest, it threw me at first. Oh, man. It really did, just Second because time it was way. very much, like, cut, cut, and then suddenly in that in that one cut, without any sort of, like, fade or suggestion of time, things had happened. And it did throw me, but by the time I'd got to the end, I appreciated, I felt like I'd spent years with these people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's something where this time is, you feel it, because you see the, uh, the seed, I mean, the, the production team, fucking what the, the, the costume team, what they've done to the people to make them older, oh, fucking wow. Um, and then you've got Michael later on, and obviously he meets uh, his uh, Apollina, Apollina, sorry, his, his wife, his first wife. Um, that, that's shocking the, the car scene, you know. Which this is what I found so funny about this film. So obviously everyone talks about Godfather having part one, part two. But Godfather one feels like it's a film of two parts yep, anyway. Yep, yep. When you get to the end of that sort of like diner scene, that's basically the end of part one. Yep. And then you pick up with him in his uh, rise Sicily. To, how his rise to being the head of the family and everything yeah. like this. You've got a lovely scene where you sat in the chair like this. It's first, you've got Michael in the chair in the right, and you've got Vito in the centre chair. Then Vito stands up. Michael sits in the centre chair, and um, it's the, I think it's like the Tavana scene that he probably put as the thumb title, where, um, what's his name? He's got his hand on there like that. Um, other notable, because I know there's time, we're running on time because he's the godfather, you've got to talk a lot about this. Um, James Cam, he's incredible, Sonny. He's very explosive. That's what you need. You need that as the underboss. You need that as a guy. And eventually, for him, obviously, like to, to kick off and like Carlos. Um, he, he, he baits him and that's how he dies and it's his hot-headedness that gets him killed incredible like, that's amazing and he, he delivers an amazing scene um, Robert Duvall I love Robert Duvall this film is the film that I love Robert Duvall mm. Tom Hagen is a spectacular character I love it he's so calm composed he just does the job he's always there first in the family but unfortunately he can't be the top of the family because he's not Sicilian that's yeah. why he's yeah. an adopted um, son slash brother um, and I actually thought Connie the sister was um, Sophia Coppola but it turns out that she actually appears in the film elsewhere um, as for Coppola as a little kid um, and then you have Kate and I know she's not um, She obviously there's a second part there's a second film Kate's not the strongest in the first film because she doesn't have much screen presence Yeah. but coming into the second one there's that lovely film at the very end where she's like you know is it true were you lying do you got to tell me don't tell me about the family no, let me know like this It's so I think the film is one that I, I actually kind of can't believe exists we kind of shipped around the idea of going with other directors instead. I think uh, Sergio Leone was considered at one point, really? um, but turned it down weirdly enough to Once Upon a Time in America, which we'll get to one day. Um, and then it all comes together through a 
thorough, one thing we kind of skipped over, really thick production value. Like incredible, incredible. Like how do you get that time back then? In terms of costumes, in terms of in terms of um, set design, in terms of the whole world building. I know they blew a shit ton of money on like the sets and stuff. The, it's, budget. it's the budget's like six, seven million, something like that. Yeah, five or six, seven million, which is nineteen seventy two. Which is like it's just it's a film which is it sounds stupid to say it to somebody. If you haven't seen The Godfather, go watch The Godfather. It almost doesn't need to be said. Yeah. But I think once you sit down and you watch it and you really start to appreciate the idea that somebody had to sit down pre Godfather existing and craft this and how bad it could have gone, you start to appreciate what Francis Ford Coppola was able to do. There's a reason this makes lists like I think it's second on the majority lists is the best film of all time this is a lot of people's second um, I, I would say it's up there as near the top one of the best films you'll ever see in your life ever yep so there is The Godfather you can let us know in the comments below what you thought of The Godfather uh, but Andy and I are going to be back once again next week where the conversation continues oh, because we're going to take a look at The Godfather Part 2 it's kind of obvious that we're going to. How do you not? <laughs> Until then, get watching.